Okay, in chapter 9, we're going to talk about traversing. This has some similarities to when we did uh, differential leveling. We did a traverse going around all the uh, through all the turning points and all the benchmarks to be able to do something. So there's some similarities here. But to be honest with you, there are some... Uh, there are some differences that uh, that we're going to address and that we're going to highlight here. So the first thing that we have is what we're going to call is considered to be a closed traverse. A closed traverse can be two things. It can be either geometric closed. So as you see on A right here that it's a uh, geometric shape that it closes back out. You start at A, go to station B, C, D, E and back to A. Or you have uh, a non-geometrically closed traverse. <clears throat> and, and the thing is, well, what does that really mean? Well, if you look at A, it's got a symbol right there. It has what we call a control point. Okay, control point means we are actually setting our instrument up on top of this control point. It is something special. We, we like the location as opposed to differential leveling. Differential leveling, we set up wherever we wanted. We use turning points and benchmarks to transfer elevations from one to the other. In this instance here, we're actually using the actual location of the control point, setting up on top of there and making measured angles and distances from there to another spot, all while we're measuring azimuths, we're measuring interior angles, whatever it may be to allow us to go through there. So we've had practice up to this point of dealing with um, uh, station sketches, starting at one point and going to another based upon a certain azimuth or a certain interior angle to the right or to the left that you turn, which allows you then to establish an azimuth going forward. So again, we're starting, we're establishing, saying we are standing on point A, we're going to point B, we want to know the relationship now between those two exact points. So there's two ways to figure out how well we do. One is uh, in a closed traverse. Closed traverse then allows us, if we start at A, well, if we go all the way around, we should end back at A on a geometrically closed traverse. In B right here, we start at A and we're going to end over at E. And then we're going to cite what they call azimuth MK2, which is another control point. If we can verify that we say that control point is where it really is, then we know we did a good job. So you'll find that there's an advantage then to a closed traverse. Closed traverses, they provide a check on all our observed angles and our, all our distances that are measured. That's what's really important when we get into surveying and we get into any control networks or anything that we, we have to rely upon to be able to build something, design something, do anything that we're dealing with requires this sort of check. Now an open traverse is the exact opposite. You can see that I can start here at A with a benchmark, go to B with a benchmark, great or uh, excuse me, a control point. But as you see now, as I continue on from B to C to D, E to F, and everywhere else that I go, I end at G. Well, G is just another traverse station. It's just another point out there. There's nothing saying that I couldn't have messed up over here at, over at C. Or as I continued on, I could have messed up somewhere at D. Or there's nothing saying that I didn't make a mistake. I don't ever want to always focus on only all the mistakes we make. We could very really have done an awesome job and not made a single mistake. But the problem with that is there isn't a check. There is nothing to check exactly what you did. So you have to be careful when you ever get involved in dealing with if whether you create an open traverse or you are using data based on an open traverse. Now stations can be referenced where they need to be referenced and, and, uh, and in many different ways. The reason why we reference them is because what happens if they get lost? If we have data that is, is uh, dependent upon wherever these, uh, these control stations are, these control points or these uh, traverse stations, we have to be able to go back to them time and time again to be able to repeat and continue to be able to repeat that location so that we know that our control is good, we know that what we're designing is right, or what we're building is right. So if you look right here, we've had a lab on this as well, so those that have been in lab that you've uh, got some experience, that um, we want to be able to reference it. So we reference it to known points, known locations. And really all it is is just a distance, it's a measured distance. That way if uh, you know uh, from one location to another, say from the fire hydrant over here, you know that location over to where your position is. Okay, that tells you pretty close where you're at. Now if I make one only one additional measurement of 2845 to the tree, okay, that actually, theoretically, if everything was perfect, I'd have one intersection of those 
two radii of where they could actually hit and be in the exact same spot. But you need to at least throw a third one in there. That way you can always have a check and to verify again what it is we're doing. So you can see in traversing, by going, especially using closed traverses, you're going from one something known to another something known. Or you have checks to make sure that what you're doing is right. So in the case of here and referencing where your station is, two is going to really put it down there really well, but you still have a second, uh, two potentials of where it could be depending on any errors that may be involved. That third is the key. The third is that final piece, the check, to make sure that, no, this is exactly what we're doing and dealing with. Methods look like this if you're talking about tying a reference station. So here at H, that's a reference station. A or B is going to work just fine, uh, however you want to do it. H is really good because you've got four points all around you that you can uh, make measurements from. So three can be used, and then the fourth can be, a, be an additional check. Over here on B, it's still a great way to do it. Uh, you don't run into as much uh, as many checks as well. So say if you set these points here at A and B, you've got to make sure those are very specifically, they're exactly on the line you want to deal with. Because if they could be off just a little bit, your line could actually run up a different way, not be exactly where you want it. So again, it's a great way to still be able to reference wherever your um, traverse station is, but you have to be a lot more careful on making sure that B and A are truly on the line between A and H, or D and C are truly on the or I should say D is truly on the line between H and C to make sure that is true and right. So hang on one second, let me uh, get in here. Okay, so we talk about, we dealt with traverses. We have, uh, and for the most part, so you see the title here, Angular Misclosure. You're going to see that we're talking about, this one has to be a, um, it's a, it's a geometrically closed traverse is, is typically what we're going to be using. Um, but you, again, you can do this with a, uh, with a uh, non-geometrically closed traverse to be able to make adjustments. But to, to teach you the principle, I'm going to use a geometrically closed traverse and discuss more on the, the geometrically closed traverse to help you understand what it is that's going on. So with angular misclosure, we have interior angles and then we have a closed traverse. So those are the two main important parts. To understand what this geometric portion is, we need to know what the total angular uh, summation should be on the inside. So for uh, any polygon, it's n minus 2 times 180. For exterior angles, if you're measuring exterior angles, well then to also for a geometrically closed traverse, okay, you're going to find that it's n plus 2 times 180. So this is how you can then double check. You go through all everything, you make your measurements, you make your distance measurements and your angle measurements. Here you're going to check your angles and find out, okay, how well did we actually do? So take this for example. Say that I sum up all the interior angles of a six-sided polygon to be 720 degrees, 20 seconds. What is my total angular misclosure? <clears throat> so you take this. We know what it's supposed to be. We know it's supposed to be 720 degrees exact. And actually, I think what I meant to do here, let's, let's, let's mark that off and let's put 9 seconds. This is going to match up and follow along suit with the rest of my uh, example here. Okay, so if I have 720 degrees, 9 seconds, minus off the 720 degrees, it's 9 seconds. So we were 9 seconds too large. So it, that becomes then a positive. If you misclosed below what it's supposed to be, then it'd actually be a, a negative misclosure. So now we considered and talk about is allowable misclosure. And we've talked about this before of uh, distances or angles or just something in general as, uh, as we talked about air propagation. So we talk about our allowable misclosure. Here's our formula. C is equal to K times the square root of N. K, C is your allowable misclosure. K is a constant. So this is your FGCS uh, constant. So from the Federal Geodetic Control Subcommittee. So uh, that constant then, so if you're looking to be a first order survey, uh, then K would be 1.7 seconds. If you were looking for a second order class 1, then 3 seconds, and so on and so forth as you go throughout the, the rest of those constants. And of course is the number of angles that you're going to measure inside that traverse. So in the previous example, let's say that I wanted a second order class 1 survey. What is my allowable misclosure? 
Okay, so here's our, our allowable misclosure if I wanted a second order class one survey. You go through, you plug in the information. So you see K, I put in uh, second order class one, so three seconds, times the square root of six, gives me 7.35 seconds. That's my allowable misclosure. So when I said I misclosed by nine seconds, what order of survey did I, uh, did I do? So to, to do that, let's go back and solve for K. Go back and solve for K, it's using the exact same equation, but this time we know C, we know N, and now let's solve for K. In K we get to be 3.67. So if you look there and figure out, okay, what it is, uh, you know, how well did we actually do, we end up then 3.67B is second order class two. Okay, you can see that second order class one right there is three seconds. Make sure we understand that anything above that three seconds is no longer second order class one. So that's why we're at 3.67. We fall in between the 4.5 and the three, which gives us a second order class two. All right, there's another thing to look at when we talk about traversing and how we can uh, approach something. Uh, and what we call, this one is called radial traversing. So it's very helpful, very easy to be able to do, but at the same time can be very dangerous. We have two examples here. We have A and we have B uh, to, to decide, okay, which one is, uh, you know, let's look and see which one's more dangerous. So still here, you look at A, we have a control point at Z and we have a control point at O. So between O and Z, anything we do, we can always check back and, and see that everything's right. But now we make measurements over to A. We make a measurement up to B, C, D, E, and F. Question is, how do you know that's right? It could be right. It could be perfect and right on the money. But there could be a little bit of an error. After you checked yourself, after you cited Z and double-checked your angle and said, okay, I'm good, you could have knocked the instrument. It could have uh, settled a little bit. Anything could have happened so that now you make these measurements over to these other positions and you're not quite sure that it's right. So again, it's not bad, it's easy, it's simple and quick. But you really are dependent on making sure that you know you're not making any mistakes. So how do we double check that? How do we fix that by still using radial traversing? Well, what, what happens now if we throw in a second control point on the inside, and now every point has two angles, two distances that are measured to it? That's what allows us now to have checks, to allow us to verify that, okay, A is good. Both points that we calculated from O and O prime, calculated to be really close to the same position, I know that's a good location. So radial traversing, again, is very easy, very simple. You cite whatever you can, you set the instrument up once. Setting up again twice and making a double set of measurements, then that's what allows, you know, computing uh, or, or creating a way to be able to make sure that what you're doing is good. Nobody's going to say that you're wrong or bad. But what they always do like, though, is something that will allow you to, to say, this is what I did to check myself. This is proof to check myself that everything looks right.